What was Lend Lease? Lend Lease was a plan, developed and strongly supported by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1882 to 1945, to extend material assistance to the Allied powers fighting the Axis powers in World War II. 1939 to 45, in the days preceding U.S. involvement in the war. Roosevelt argued that it was imperative for the country to come to the aid of those fighting Germany and Italy it was similar to helping your neighbor put out a fire in his house in order to prevent your own house from catching fire and burning. Under Lend-Lease, which was passed by Congress on March 11, 1941, approximately $50 billion of aid in the form of food and supplies, weapons, machinery and other equipment was provided to the Allied nations primarily to Britain and the Commonwealth nations first. But later to all nations fighting against Hitler's war machine. The return of the goods was not addressed until after the war had ended. At that time, most people felt the Allies had all contributed everything they had to the war effort and that the sacrifices made by Allied Europe in the days prior to U.S. Entry into the fighting were balanced by the contributions made under the Lend-Lease Act. Why did the U. S. government send troops after Pancho Villa? Pancho Villa, 1878-1923, was sought by the U.S. government because in 1916 he and his followers attacked Americans on both sides of the border. In 1915 the United States decided it would back the acting chief of Mexico. Venustiano Carranza, 1859-1920, even as he faced attacks from two of his fellow revolutionaries. Emiliano Zapata, 1879-1919, and Pancho Villa. Four years earlier, Villa had himself sought to control Mexico after the fall of President Porfirio Diaz. When the United States cut off the flow of ammunition to the rebels, Villa who was a fierce fighter, earned himself a reputation as a bandit. Seeking revenge on Americans in Mexico by stopping trains and shooting the passengers. In 1916 Villa raided the small New Mexico village of Columbus, where he killed 18 people. The attack prompted President Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924. To send U.S. soldiers to hunt Villa down and capture him. Though thousands of men were put on the initiative under General John Pershing. 1860 to 1940, they never caught up with the bandit. Wilson withdrew the forces from Mexico after the government there expressed. Resentment for the U.S. effort which the Mexican people, President Carranza included. Viewed as a meddlesome American interference in the Mexican Revolution, 1910-20. The revolution ended three years later, after ten years of fighting and disorder. What is the Treaty of Paris? 1870-1919. 
there has been more than one Treaty of Paris. The following international agreements were signed in the French capital. In 1763 representatives of Great Britain, France and Spain signed a treaty, which Along with the Treaty of Hubertusburg, February 15, 1763, ended the Seven Years' War, 1756-63. On September 3, 1783, the Treaty of Paris which had been under negotiation since 1782, was signed by the British and the Americans, represented by statesman Benjamin Franklin. 1706-1790, John Adams, 1735-1826, and John Jay, 1745-1829. The agreement officially ended the American Revolution, 1775 to 83, establishing the United States as an independent country and drawing the boundaries of the new nation which extended west to the Mississippi River, north to Canada, east to the Atlantic Ocean, and south as far as Florida, which was given to Spain. In 1814 and 1815 treaties were signed ending the Napoleonic Wars, which the French ruler Napoleon Bonaparte 1769 to 1821, had begun shortly after taking power in 1799. In 1856 European nations signed a treaty in Paris ending the Crimean War, 1853 to 56, and outlawing the wartime practice of privateering. The Treaty of Paris that was signed December 10, 1898, settled. The conflict that had resulted in the Spanish-American War, 1898. This treaty provided for Cuba's full independence from Spain. It also granted control of Guam and Puerto Rico to the United States. The pact further stipulated that the United States would pay Spain $20 million for the Philippine Islands. In 1951, in the wake of World War II, 1939-45, Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and West Germany signed the Treaty of Paris, which established the European Coal and Steel Community, ECSC. The desire was to bring about economic and political unity among the democratic nations of Europe. This agreement paved the way for the European Union affected by the Maastricht Treaty. An economic agreement signed by representatives of 12 European countries in the Netherlands in 1992. What was Custer's last stand? The term refers to the defeat of General George A. Custer, 1839-1876, at the Battle of Little Bighorn on June 25, 1876. Custer had a National reputation as a Civil War general and Indian fighter in the West. And when he and his troops were outnumbered and badly beaten by the Sioux led by Sitting Bull, c. 1831-1890, just as the country was about to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence the result was a stunning reversal in the national mood. Little Bighorn was part of a series of campaigns known collectively as the Sioux War. Several events led to the conflict that became Custer's last stand. <laughs>
the Sioux were non-treaty Indians. Which means they had refused to accept the white dictated limits on their territory. They were outraged at the repeated violation of their lands by the onrush of miners to new gold strikes in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Further, there had been eight attacks by the Sioux on the Crow who were living on reservation land. Finally, Sitting Bull, the chief of the Hunk Papa Band of Sioux, refused government demands that he and his people return to reservation lands. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the government's military strategists, by spring 1876 Sitting Bull had been joined in his cause by other groups of Northern Plains tribes, including the Cheyenne led by Crazy Horse. C 1842-1877 With the government ready to use force to return Sitting Bull and his band of Sioux to reservations. The stage was set for a conflict bigger than any Washington official had imagined. On June 25 Custer rode into Montana Territory with his 7th Cavalry to meet the Sioux. Despite orders to simply contain the Indians and prevent their escape, he attacked. While historians remain divided on how Custer could have been defeated on that fateful June day. One thing remains certain, Custer and his men were badly outnumbered. Having divided his regiment into three parts, Custer rode with about 225 men against a force of at least 2,000 the largest gathering of Indian warriors in Western history. Custer and his soldiers all died. The fighting continued into the next day. With those Indians that remained finally disbanding and returning to their designated territory. Meantime, Sitting Bull and his band retreated into Canada. Returning to the United States five years later, in 1890, Sitting Bull was killed by authorities. The battle became the subject of countless movies, books, and songs. It's remembered by some Native Americans as a galvanizing force proof that brave men who fight for what they believe in can win. What happened to the Philippines after they were ceded by Spain? After the United States gained control of the Philippines in the Treaty of Paris, 1898, the Pacific Archipelago was soon embroiled in a conflict similar to the one in Cuba, which had developed into the Spanish-American War, Filipinos, determined to achieve independence revolted in an uprising that lasted from 1899 to 1901. A civil government was established on the Philippines in 1901, and in November 1935. The Commonwealth of the Philippines was officially established. However, the islands would continue to be the site of conflict in the coming decades. As the United States again struggled with a foreign power this time the Japanese for control of the islands during World War II, 1939-45. What was the Nanking Massacre? One of the most brutal chapters in modern history, the Nanking Massacre, also called the Rape of Nanking, 1939-45.
was a mass execution of hundreds of thousands of unarmed Chinese civilians. By invading Japanese soldiers in December 1937 and January 1938. No one knows for certain. How many people were murdered in the mass killings, but most estimates place the number. At 300,000, with another 80,000 people raped and tortured, including women and children. On December 13, 1937, the Japanese Royal Army swept into the eastern Chinese city of Nanking. Today called Nanjing, which was then the capital of China. In the weeks that followed, the Japanese soldiers went on an orgy of violence. The atrocities were documented on film by the Japanese themselves as well as by helpless foreigners in the city at the time of the seizure. Surviving photos show unimaginable cruelties. It is believed that Japan's military had been trained to carry out the killings and atrocities in order to make an example of Nanking to other Chinese people, thereby facilitating Japan's intended occupation. The horrific event was the source of recent controversy stirred by the 1997 publication of The Rape of Nanking. The Forgotten Holocaust of World War II by Iris Chang 1968, a historian and journalist whose grandparents narrowly escaped the massacre. Unlike Germany, which accepted responsibility for the Holocaust of Jews during World War II. 1939-45, and whose Nazi leaders were tried in number at Nuremberg. Japan never acknowledged its crimes committed at Nanking. After World War II only a few of Japan's military leaders were tried and found guilty of war crimes related to the taking of Nanking. This chapter in Japan's national history has been largely denied by its officials. Some of whom accused Chang of issuing propaganda. Chang stood by her research, which included interviews with survivors. As well as with Japanese soldiers who participated in the violence. The massacre remains a deeply divisive event between the two nations and their people. Who was Tamerlane? Tamerlane, 1336-1405, was a Central Asian conqueror who gained power in the late 1300s. His Islamic name was Timur, Tamerlane is the English version. He was a barbaric warrior and a brilliant military leader whose fearsome tactics earned him the name Tamerlane the Terrible. By 1370 he was a powerful warlord whose government was centered in the province of Samarkand. In present-day Uzbekistan. In 1383 he launched a series of conquests that lasted more than 20 years and gained him control of a vast region including Iraq. Armenia, Mesopotamia, Georgia, Russia, and parts of India. He died in 1405, on an expedition to conquer China. His body was entombed in an elaborate mausoleum, which is considered a treasure of Islamic art. After his death, his sons and grandsons fought for control of his dynasty, which remained intact for another hundred years. Tamerlane and his heirs built Samarkand into a great city.
In its day it was a center for culture and scholarship in Central Asia. What does Viva Zapata mean? It was the cry that went up in support of the rebel general Emiliano Zapata, 1879-1919. Whose chief concern during the Mexican Revolution, 1910-20, was the distribution of land to the people. An advocate of Mexico's lower classes, Zapata began revolutionary activities against the government of Porfirio Diaz. 1830-1915, as early as 1897. Zapata rose to prominence in helping the liberal and idealistic Francisco Madero. 1873-1913, overthrow Diaz in 1911. With Madero placed in power. Zapata promptly began pressing his co-conspirator for a program to distribute the hacienda, large estate, lands to the peasants. Rebuffed by Madero that same year, Zapata drafted the agrarian plan of Ayala and renewed the revolution. Madero's government never achieved stability and proved to be ineffective. Prompting a second overthrow in 1913, Victoriano Huerta, 1854-1916, seized power from Madero. Whom he had helped put into office, and in the chaos surrounding the coup, Madero was shot and killed. But Zapata refused to support Huerta and remained a leader of the revolution. Continuing his crusade for the people who supported him with cheers of Viva Zapata, meaning long live Zapata. The bitter fighting of the revolution continued and soon those who had supported the slain Madero including Zapata and Pancho Villa. 1878-1923, through their backing behind another revolutionary, Venustiano Carranza, 1859-1920. In 1914 Carranza's forces occupied Mexico City and forced Huerta to leave the country. No sooner had Carranza taken office than the revolutionaries began fighting among themselves. Zapata and Pancho Villa demanded dramatic reforms and together they attacked. Mexico City in 1914. Five years later, and one year before the end of the revolution. Carranza's army ambushed and assassinated Zapata in his home state of Morelos. What was the Atlantic Charter? On the eve of direct U.S. involvement in World War II, 1939-45, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1882-1945, met with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. 1874-1965, on board a ship off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. There the two leaders drew up a program of peace objectives known as the Atlantic Charter. Which they signed on August 14, 1941. In addition to other peacetime goals. The charter roughly contained Roosevelt's four freedoms, which he had outlined in his speech to Congress on January 6, 1941. As the legislative body considered passage of the Lend-Lease Act, Roosevelt believed that freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, 
freedom from want, and freedom from fear should prevail around the world. Briefly, in the Atlantic Charter the two leaders stated that neither of their countries sought new territories. That they respected the right of the people of each country to choose their own form of government. That no country, great or small, victor or vanquished, would be deprived access to the raw materials it needed for its own economic prosperity. That countries should cooperate to improve labor standards and social security, that after the final destruction of the Nazi tyranny, all the men in all the lands may live out their lives in freedom from fear and want. And that a wider and permanent system of general security would be necessary to ensure peace. This last statement alludes to the future establishment of the United Nations. What was the Atlantic Charter? On the eve of direct U. S. involvement in World War II, 1939 to 45, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1882 to 1945 met with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. 1874-1965, on board a ship off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. There the two leaders drew up a program of peace objectives known as the Atlantic Charter. Which they signed on August 14, 1941. In addition to other peacetime goals. The charter roughly contained Roosevelt's four freedoms, which he had outlined in his speech to Congress on January 6, 1941. As the legislative body considered passage of the Lend-Lease Act, Roosevelt believed that freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear should prevail around the world. Briefly, in the Atlantic Charter the two leaders stated that neither of their countries sought new territories. That they respected the right of the people of each country to choose their own form of government. That no country, great or small, victor or vanquished, would be deprived access to the raw materials it needed for its own economic prosperity. That countries should cooperate to improve labor standards and social security, that after the final destruction of the Nazi tyranny, all the men in all the lands may live out their lives in freedom from fear and want. And that a wider and permanent system of general security would be necessary to ensure peace. This last statement alludes to the future establishment of the United Nations. Why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? There is still disagreement among historians, military scholars, and investigators about why the island nation of Japan issued this surprise attack on the U. S. military installation at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Some believe that Japan had been baited into making the attack in order to marshal public opinion behind U.S. entry into World War II, 1939-45. Others maintain that the United States was unprepared for such an assault, or at least, the Japanese believed Americans to be in a state of unreadiness. And still others theorize that Pearl Harbor was an all-or-nothing gamble. 
on the part of Japan to knock America's navy out of the war before it had even entered into the fray. These are the facts, in 1941 Japanese troops had moved into the southern part of Indochina. Prompting the United States to cut off its exports to Japan. In fall of that year, as General Hideki Tojo, 1884-1948, became Prime Minister of Japan. The country's military leaders were laying plans to wage war on the United States. On December 7 Pearl Harbor, the hub of U.S. naval power in the Pacific, became the target of Japanese attacks. As did the American military bases at Guam, Wake Island, and the Philippines. But it was the bombing of Pearl Harbor that became the rallying cry for Americans during the long days of World War II since it was at this strategic naval station which had been occupied under treaty by the U.S. military since 1908, that Americans had felt the impact of the conflict. Why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? There is still disagreement among historians, military scholars, and investigators about why the island nation of Japan issued this surprise attack on the U.S. military installation at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Some believe that Japan had been baited into making the attack in order to marshal public opinion behind U.S. entry into World War II. 1939 to 45 Others maintain that the United States was unprepared for such an assault or at least the Japanese believed Americans to be in a state of unreadiness And still others theorize that Pearl Harbor was an all or nothing gamble on the part of Japan to knock America's navy out of the war before it had even entered into the fray these are the facts, in 1941 Japanese troops had moved into the southern part of Indochina. Prompting the United States to cut off its exports to Japan. In fall of that year, as General Hideki Tojo, 1884-1948, became Prime Minister of Japan. The country's military leaders were laying plans to wage war on the United States. On December 7 Pearl Harbor, the hub of U.S. naval power in the Pacific, became the target of Japanese attacks. As did the American military bases at Guam, Wake Island, and the Philippines. But it was the bombing of Pearl Harbor that became the rallying cry for Americans during the Long days of World War II since it was at this strategic naval station, which had been occupied under treaty by the U.S. military since 1908, that Americans had felt the impact of the conflict. What happened at Pearl Harbor? On the night before the attack, the Japanese moved a fleet of 33 ships to within 200 miles of the Hawaiian island of Oahu, where Pearl Harbor is situated. More than 300 planes took off from the Japanese carriers. Dropping the first bombs on Pearl Harbor just before 8 a.m. on December 7. 1941 there were eight American battleships and more than 90 naval vessels in the harbor at the time. 
21 of these were destroyed or damaged, as were 300 planes. The biggest single loss of the day was the sinking of the battleship USS Arizona, which went down in less than 9 minutes. More than half the fatalities at Pearl Harbor that infamous. December day were due to the sinking of the Arizona. By the end of the raid, more than 2,300 people had been killed and about the same number were wounded. Pearl Harbor forever changed the United States and its role in the world. When President Franklin D. Roosevelt 1882-1945, addressed Congress the next day, he called December 7 a date which will live in infamy. The United States declared war against Japan. And on December 11th Germany and Italy Japan's Axis allies declared war on the United States. The events of December 7th had brought America into the war. A conflict from which it would emerge as the leader of the free world. When did the first U.S. What happened at Pearl Harbor? On the night before the attack, the Japanese moved a fleet of 33 ships to within 200 miles of the Hawaiian island of Oahu, where Pearl Harbor is situated. More than 300 planes took off from the Japanese carriers. Dropping the first bombs on Pearl Harbor just before 8 a.m. on December 7. 1941 there were eight American battleships and more than 90 naval vessels in the harbor at the time. 21 of these were destroyed or damaged, as were 300 planes. The biggest single loss of the day was the sinking of the battleship USS Arizona, which went down in less than nine minutes. More than half the fatalities at Pearl Harbor that infamous December day were due to the sinking of the Arizona. By the end of the raid, more than 2,300 people had been killed and about the same number were wounded. Pearl Harbor forever changed the United States and its role in the world. When President Franklin D. Roosevelt 1882-1945, addressed Congress the next day, he called December 7 a date which will live in infamy. The United States declared war against Japan. And on December 11 Germany and Italy Japan's Axis allies declared war on the United States. The events of December 7 had brought America into the war. A conflict from which it would emerge as the leader of the free world. When did the first U.S. Troops begin fighting in World War II? Late in 1942 the United States sent its first troops across the Atlantic, making amphibious landings in North Africa, followed by Sicily and the Italian Peninsula. The first Allied landings were in Morocco, Casablanca, and Algeria, Oran and Algiers, on November 8 of that year. Algiers became the Allied headquarters in North Africa for the duration of the war. The combined forces of the initial landing included more than 100,000 troops. <laughs> 
launching the American military effort in the Atlantic theater of conflict. One American newspaper headline announced, Yanks invade Africa. Was the U.S. Troops begin fighting in World War II? Late in 1942 the United States sent its first troops across the Atlantic, making amphibious landings in North Africa, followed by Sicily and the Italian Peninsula. The first Allied landings were in Morocco, Casablanca, and Algeria, Oran and Algiers, on November 8 of that year. Algiers became the Allied headquarters in North Africa for the duration of the war. The combined forces of the initial landing included more than 100,000 troops. Launching the American military effort in the Atlantic theater of conflict. One American newspaper headline announced, Yanks invade Africa. Was the U.S. Mainland attacked during World War II? Yes, the continental United States was hit twice during the war. But with no casualties and only minimal damage. The first attack occurred at approximately 7 p.m. on February 23. 1942, when a Japanese submarine shelled an oil storage field at Elwood Beach, California, about 12 miles north of Santa Barbara. The Japanese were trying to hit oil tanks there. Evidently with the intent of producing a spectacular explosion. But after firing a reported 16 or 17 rounds, they had struck only a pier. Most of the shells fell into the sea. Well short of their targets. U.S. planes gave chase, but the submarine got away. There were no injuries and only minimal damage. But the event put the nation on heightened alert to the possibility of more attacks. The February 23 attack took place shortly after President Franklin Roosevelt. 1882 to 1945, had begun his fireside chat, addressing the nation over the radio. He talked about how this war was different, since it was being waged on every continent. Every island, every sea, every air lane in the world. He also said, the broad oceans which have been heralded in the past as our protection from attack have become endless battlefields on which we are constantly being challenged by our enemies. The unsuccessful assault at Elwood was the first attack on mainland U.S. soil since the War of 1812, 1812-14. The event stirred fears of conspiracy and rattled nerves up and down the West Coast. There was one other. Strike on mainland soil during World War II, at Fort Stevens, Oregon, at the mouth of the Columbia River. On the evening of June 21, 1942, a Japanese submarine fired some 17 rounds of shells at the coastal military installation but caused no damage. Mainland attacked during World War II? 
Yes, the continental United States was hit twice during the war. But with no casualties and only minimal damage. The first attack occurred at approximately 7 p.m. on February 23, 1942, when a Japanese submarine shelled an oil storage field at Elwood Beach, California, about 12 miles north of Santa Barbara. The Japanese were trying to hit oil tanks there. Evidently with the intent of producing a spectacular explosion. But after firing a reported 16 or 17 rounds, they had struck only a pier. Most of the shells fell into the sea. Well short of their targets. US planes gave chase, but the submarine got away. There were no injuries and only minimal damage. But the event put the nation on heightened alert to the possibility of more attacks. The February 23rd attack took place shortly after President Franklin Roosevelt. 1882 to 1945, had begun his fireside chat, addressing the nation over the radio. He talked about how this war was different, since it was being waged on every continent. Every island, every sea, every airlane in the world. He also said, the broad oceans which have been heralded in the past as our protection from attack have become endless battlefields on which we are constantly being challenged by our enemies. The unsuccessful assault at Elwood was the first attack on mainland U.S. soil since the War of 1812, 1812 to 14. The event stirred fears of conspiracy and rattled nerves up and down the West Coast. There was one other strike on mainland soil during World War II, at Fort Stevens, Oregon, at the mouth of the Columbia River. On the evening of June 21, 1942, a Japanese submarine fired some 17 rounds of shells at the coastal military installation but caused no damage. Why did the U? S. Government order the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, American citizens of Japanese descent were viewed as threats to the nation's security. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt, 1882-1945 signed an executive order directing that they be moved to camps for containment for the duration of the war. More than 100,000 people, most of them from California and other West Coast states, were rounded up and ordered to live in secure camps. The action drew immediate criticism. With thousands of lives interrupted without cause, the chapter is one of the saddest in American history. In 1988 President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, which made reparations to the victims of the Japanese internment. $20,000 was paid to internees, evacuees, and persons of Japanese ancestry who lost liberty or property because of discriminatory action by the federal government during World War II. It also established a $1.25 billion public education fund to teach children and the public about the internment period.
why did the U.S. government order the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II? After the attack on Pearl Harbor, American citizens of Japanese descent were viewed as threats to the nation's security. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt, 1882-1945, signed an executive order directing that they be moved to camps for containment for the duration of the war. More than 100,000 people, most of them from California and other West Coast states, were rounded up and ordered to live in secure camps. The action drew immediate criticism. With thousands of lives interrupted without cause, the chapter is one of the saddest in American history. In 1988 President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, which made reparations to the victims of the Japanese internment. $20,000 was paid to internees, evacuees, and persons of Japanese ancestry who lost liberty or property because of discriminatory action by the federal government during World War II. It also established a $1.25 billion public education fund to teach children and the public about the internment period. What happened at Anzio? Anzio, Italy, was the site of a four-month battle between Allied troops and the Germans during World War II, 1939-45. On January 22, 1944, more than 36,000 Allied troops and thousands of vehicles made an amphibious landing at Anzio, which is situated on a peninsula jutting into the Tyrrhenian Sea. But German soldiers, led by Field Marshal Albert Kess Erling, 1885-1960, were able to surround the Allied forces, containing them along the shoreline into May of that year. Fighting was intense, with an estimated 60,000 casualties, about half on each side. On May 25, 1944, the Germans withdrew in defeat. Enabling the Allies to march toward Rome, 33 miles to the north-northwest. The taking of Anzio was a tactical surprise on the part of the U.S. and British. And their eventual victory there was a turning point for the Allies in the war. What happened at Anzio? Anzio, Italy, was the site of a four-month battle between Allied troops and the Germans during World War II, 1939-45. On January 22, 1944, more than 36,000 Allied troops and thousands of vehicles made an amphibious landing at Anzio which is situated on a peninsula jutting into the Tyrrhenian Sea. But German soldiers, led by Field Marshal Albert Kess Erling, 1885-1960, were able to surround the Allied forces, containing them along the shoreline into May of that year. Fighting was intense, with an estimated 60,000 casualties, about half on each side. 
On May 25, 1944, the Germans withdrew in defeat. Enabling the Allies to march toward Rome, 33 miles to the north-northwest. The taking of Anzio was a tactical surprise on the part of the US and British. And their eventual victory there was a turning point for the Allies in the war. What is D-Day? The military uses the term D-Day to designate when an initiative is set to begin. Counting all events out from that date for planning. For example, D-Day minus 2 would be a plan for what needs to happen two days before the beginning of the military operation. While the military planned and executed many D-Days during World War II, 1939-45, most of them landings on enemy-held coasts. It was the June 6, 1944, invasion of Normandy that went down in history as the D-Day. What is D-Day? The military uses the term D-Day to designate when an initiative is set to begin. Counting all events out from that date for planning. For example, D-Day minus 2 would be a plan for what needs to happen two days before the beginning of the military operation. While the military planned and executed many D-Days during World War II, 1939-45, most of them landings on enemy-held coasts. It was the June 6, 1944, invasion of Normandy that went down in history as the D-Day. What happened at Normandy? Normandy, a region in northwestern France that lies along the English Channel, is known for the June 6, 1944, arrival of Allied troops, which proved to be a turning point in World War II, 1939 to 45. Officially called Operation Overlord, but known historically as D-Day, and headed by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, 1890-1969, of the United States. The initiative had been in the planning since 1943 and it constituted the largest seaborne invasion in history. After several delays due to poor weather, the Allied troops crossed the English Channel and arrived on the beaches of Normandy on the morning of June 6. Brutal fighting ensued that day, with heavy losses on both sides. At the end of the day, the Allied troops had taken hold of the beaches a firm foothold that would allow them to march inland against the Nazis, eventually pushing them back to Germany. While it was a critical Allied victory, which history has treated as the beginning of the end for German Chancellor and Führer Adolf Hitler, the invasion at Normandy was still to be followed by 11 more months of bloody conflict. Germany would not surrender until May 7 of the following year. What happened at Normandy? 
Normandy, a region in northwestern France that lies along the English Channel. Is known for the June 6, 1944, arrival of Allied troops, which proved to be a turning point in World War II, 1939-45. Officially called Operation Overlord, but known historically as D-Day, and headed by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, 1890-1969, of the United States. The initiative had been in the planning since 1943 and it constituted the largest seaborne invasion in history. After several delays due to poor weather, the Allied troops crossed the English Channel and arrived on the beaches of Normandy on the morning of June 6. Brutal fighting ensued that day, with heavy losses on both sides. At the end of the day, the Allied troops had taken hold of the beaches a firm foothold that would allow them to march inland against the Nazis, eventually pushing them back to Germany. While it was a critical Allied victory, which history has treated as the beginning of the end for German Chancellor and Führer Adolf Hitler, the invasion at Normandy was still to be followed by 11 more months of bloody conflict. Germany would not surrender until May 7 of the following year. What was the Battle of the Bulge? The term refers to the December 16, 1944, German confrontation with the American forces in the Ardennes Mountains. A forested plateau range that extends from northern France into Belgium and Luxembourg. Even though Germany appeared to be beaten at this late point in the war, Hitler rallied his remaining forces and launched a surprise assault on the American soldiers in Belgium and Luxembourg. But Germany could not sustain the front, and within two weeks the Americans had halted the German advance near Belgium's Meuse River, south of Brussels. The offensive became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Because of the protruding shape of the battleground on a map, the Ardennes were also the site of conflict earlier in World War II. In 1940, as well as in World War I, in 1914 and 1918, what was the Battle of the Bulge? The term refers to the December 16, 1944, German confrontation with the American forces in the Ardennes Mountains. A forested plateau range that extends from northern France into Belgium and Luxembourg. Even though Germany appeared to be beaten at this late point in the war, Hitler rallied his remaining forces and launched a surprise assault on the American soldiers in Belgium and Luxembourg. But Germany could not sustain the front, and within two weeks the Americans had halted the German advance near Belgium's Meuse River, south of Brussels. The offensive became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Because of the protruding shape of the battleground on a map, the Ardennes were also the site of conflict earlier in World War II. In 1940, as well as in World War I, in 1914 and 1918.
why did General MacArthur vow to return? Two weeks after the Japanese bombing of the U. As military bases at Pearl Harbor and the Philippines, Japan invaded the Philippine Islands. General Douglas MacArthur, 1880-1964 The commander of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East, led the defense of the archipelago. He had begun to organize his troops around Manila Bay when, in March 1942, he received orders from the president to leave the islands. When he reached Australia, MacArthur said, I shall return, in reference to the Philippines. Under new commands, MacArthur directed the Allied forces. Offensive against Japan throughout the Southwest Pacific Islands. After a string of successes, on October 20, 1944, MacArthur made good on his promise. Landing on the Philippine island of Leyte, accompanied by a great invasion force. By July of the following year, the general had established practical control of the Philippines. When Japan surrendered in August, MacArthur was made the supreme commander of the Allies, and as such, he presided over the Japanese surrender aboard the USS Missouri on September 2. He received the Medal of Honor for his defense of the Philippines. But he wasn't the only hero in the MacArthur family, his father. Arthur MacArthur, 1845-1912, had received the nation's highest military award during the Civil War, 1861-65. Why did General MacArthur vow to return? Two weeks after the Japanese bombing of the U. As military bases at Pearl Harbor and the Philippines, Japan invaded the Philippine Islands. General Douglas MacArthur, 1880-1964 the commander of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East, led the defense of the archipelago. He had begun to organize his troops around Manila Bay when, in March 1942, he received orders from the president to leave the islands. When he reached Australia, MacArthur said, I shall return, in reference to the Philippines. Under new commands, MacArthur directed the Allied forces. Offensive against Japan throughout the Southwest Pacific Islands. After a string of successes, on October 20, 1944, MacArthur made good on his promise. Landing on the Philippine island of Leyte, accompanied by a great invasion force. By July of the following year, the general had established practical control of the Philippines. When Japan surrendered in August, MacArthur was made the supreme commander of the Allies, and as such, he presided over the Japanese surrender aboard the USS Missouri on September 2. He received the Medal of Honor for his defense of the Philippines. But he wasn't the only hero in the MacArthur family, his father. Arthur MacArthur, 1845-1912, had received the nation's highest military award during the Civil War, 1861-65.
What was the Bataan Death March? It was one of the most brutal chapters of World War II, 1939 to 45. On April 9, 1942, American forces on the Bataan Peninsula, Philippines, surrendered to the Japanese. More than 75,000 American and Filipino troops became prisoners of war, POWs. On April 10, they were forced to begin a 65-mile march to a POW camp. Conditions were torturous high temperatures, meager provisions, and gross maltreatment. The troops were denied food and water for days at a time, they were not allowed to rest in the shade. They were indiscriminately beaten, and those who fell behind were killed. On stretches where some troops were transported by train. The boxcars were packed so tightly that many POWs died of suffocation. The forced march lasted more than a week. 20,000 men died along the way. But the end of the march was not the end of the horrors for the surviving POWs. About 56,000 men were held until the end of the war. They endured starvation, torture, and horrific cruelties. Some were forced to work as slave laborers in Japanese industrial plants and some became subjects of medical experiments. In August 1945 their POW camp was liberated by the Allied forces, and the surviving troops were put on. U.S. Navy vessels for the trip home. As part of the United States 1951 peace treaty with Japan. Surviving POWs were barred from seeking reparations from Japanese firms that had benefited from their slave labor. This injustice continued to be the subject of proposed congressional legislation into the early 2000s. With no positive outcome for the veterans as of 2005. What was the Bataan Death March? It was one of the most brutal chapters of World War II, 1939-45. On April 9, 1942, American forces on the Bataan Peninsula, Philippines, surrendered to the Japanese. More than 75,000 American and Filipino troops became prisoners of war, POWs. On April 10, they were forced to begin a 65-mile march to a POW camp. Conditions were torturous high temperatures, meager provisions, and gross maltreatment. The troops were denied food and water for days at a time, they were not allowed to rest in the shade. They were indiscriminately beaten, and those who fell behind were killed. On stretches where some troops were transported by train. The boxcars were packed so tightly that many POWs died of suffocation. The forced march lasted more than a week. 20,000 men died along the way. But the end of the march was not the end of the horrors for the surviving POWs. About 56,000 men were held until the end of the war. They endured starvation, torture, and horrific cruelties. Some were forced to work as slave laborers in Japanese industrial plants and some became subjects of medical experiments. In August 1945 their POW camp was liberated by the Allied forces, 
and the surviving troops were put on. U.S. Navy Vessels for the Trip Home As part of the United States 1951 Peace Treaty with Japan Surviving POWs were barred from seeking reparations from Japanese firms that had benefited from their slave labor. This injustice continued to be the subject of proposed congressional legislation into the early 2000s. With no positive outcome for the veterans as of 2005. What was the Peace of Westphalia? In 1644, with Europe torn by the Thirty Years' War, 1618-48. A peace conference was convened in Westphalia, Germany. But the negotiations were for long years in the making. The fighting continued until 1648, when the Peace of Westphalia was finally signed. Under this treaty, France and Sweden received some German lands. The agreement also made important allowances for Europe's religions. Not only was Lutheranism given the same due as Catholicism, but Calvinism. The religious movement begun by Frenchman John Calvin, 1509-1564, was also was given the official nod. In short, the treaty not only ended the religious warfare in Europe, but it provided for some measure of religious tolerance. Since the pact recognized the sovereignty of all the states of the Holy Roman Empire, it effectively dissolved the empire. Therefore, Historians view the Peace of Westphalia as the beginning of Europe's modern state system. Who were the Big Four? Though the Paris Peace Conference, which began in January 1919, was attended by representatives of all the Allied nations. The decisions were made by four heads of government, called the Big Four, President Woodrow Wilson. 1856-1924, of the United States, Prime Minister David Lloyd George, 1863-1945, of Great Britain. Premier Georges Clemenceau, 1841-1929, of France, and Premier Vittorio Orlando, 1860-1952, of Italy. Other representatives formed committees to work out the details of the treaties that were drawn up with each of the countries that had made up World War I Central Powers. The Treaty of Versailles was signed with Germany, the Treaty of St. Germain was signed with Austria, the Treaty of New Italy was made with Bulgaria. The Treaty of Trianon was made with Hungary, and the Treaty of Sèvres was signed with the Ottoman Empire. What did the Lusitania have to do with World War I? World War I, 1914-18, was already underway when in May of 1915 a German U-boat sank a British passenger ship. The SS Lusitania, off the coast of Ireland. The ship had been launched in 1907 by Britain's Cunard Line to become the largest passenger ship afloat. In 
when she was downed in the North Atlantic, 1,200 civilians, including 128 American travelers, were killed. President Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924 Warned Germany that another such incident would force the United States into entering the war. Germany heeded the warning only for a time. What is D-Day? The military uses the term D-Day to designate when an initiative is set to begin. Counting all events out from that date for planning. For example, D-Day-2 would be a plan for what needs to happen two days before the beginning of the military operation. While the military planned and executed many D-Days during World War II, 1939-45, most of them landings on enemy-held coasts. It was the June 6, 1944, invasion of Normandy that went down in history as the D-Day. Why is Paul Revere's ride so well known? The April 18, 1775, event was famous in its own right but was memorialized by American writer Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. 1807-1882, in his poem, Paul Revere's Ride. The verse contains an error, or perhaps Longfellow simply took literary license. About the night that the American Revolution, 1775 to 83, began, the light signal that was to be flashed from Boston's Old North Church. One light if the British were approaching the Patriots by land and two if the approach was by sea. Was sent not to Revere, it was received by Revere's compatriots in Charlestown, now part of Boston proper. However, Revere did ride that night on a borrowed horse. He left Boston at about 10 p.m. and arrived in Lexington at midnight to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock, who were wanted for treason, that the British were coming. The next day, April 19, the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought. Starting the Revolutionary War in America As an American patriot, Revere, 1735-1818, was known for his service as a special messenger. So much so that by 1773 he had already been mentioned in London newspapers. Revere also participated in the Boston Tea Party in 1773. Why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? There is still disagreement among historians, military scholars, and investigators about why the island nation of Japan issued this surprise attack on the U. S. military installation at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Some believe that Japan had been baited into making the attack in order to marshal public opinion behind U.S. entry into World War II, 1939-45. Others maintain that the United States was unprepared for such an assault, or at least, the Japanese believed Americans to be in a state of unreadiness. <laughs> 
and still others theorize that Pearl Harbor was an all-or-nothing gamble. On the part of Japan to knock America's navy out of the war before it had even entered into the fray. These are the facts, in 1941 Japanese troops had moved into the southern part of Indochina. Prompting the United States to cut off its exports to Japan. In fall of that year, as General Hideki Tojo, 1884-1948, became Prime Minister of Japan. The country's military leaders were laying plans to wage war on the United States. On December 7 Pearl Harbor, the hub of U.S. naval power in the Pacific, became the target of Japanese attacks. As did the American military bases at Guam, Wake Island, and the Philippines. But it was the bombing of Pearl Harbor that became the rallying cry for Americans during the long days of World War II since it was at this strategic naval station, which had been occupied under treaty by the U.S. military since 1908, that Americans had felt the impact of the conflict. What was the Great Northern War? It was a war undertaken at the beginning of the 18th century that challenged Sweden's absolute monarchy and imperialism. During the 17th century, Sweden had become a power in the Baltic region gradually bringing more and more territory under its control. Even the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, had granted some German lands to Sweden. But much of Sweden's prosperity and expansion during this period had been under the rule of Charles XI, 1655-1697. When he was succeeded by his young son, Charles XII. 1682 to 1718, in 1697, the tides were about to turn for Sweden. In 1700, an alliance formed by Denmark, Russia, Poland, and Saxony. Part of present day Germany attacked Sweden, beginning the Great Northern War. Sweden readily defeated Denmark and the Russians that same year. But Poland and Saxony proved to be more formidable foes. And Charles XII spent almost seven years fighting and eventually defeating them. But the Russian army was to have another chance at the Swedish. And this time they were successful, defeating Charles XII's forces in 1709 at Poltava, Ukraine. Charles fled the country as the war continued and did not return until 1714. Four years after that, the monarch was killed as he observed a battle, in what is present-day Norway. Much of the country's lands in the Baltic were surrendered and Sweden's period of absolute monarchy came to an end. Why did the United States get involved in World War I? When war broke out in Europe in August 1914, Americans opposed the involvement of U.S. troops, and President Woodrow Wilson, 1856 to 1924, declared the country's neutrality. But as the fighting continued and the German tactics threatened civilian lives, <laughs> 
Americans began siding with the Allies. After the sinking of the passenger liner SS Lusitania, Germany adopted restricted submarine warfare. But early in 1917 Germany again began attacking unarmed ships. This time American cargo boats, goading the United States into the war. Meantime, German U-boats were positioning to cut off shipping to and from Britain. In an effort to force the power to surrender. Tensions between the United States and Germany peaked when the British intercepted, decoded, and turned over to President Wilson a telegram Germany had sent to its ambassador in Mexico. The so-called Zimmermann Note, which originated in the office of German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmermann. 1864-1940, urged the German officials in Mexico to persuade the Mexican government into war with the United States in order to reconquer or lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The message was published in the United States in early March. One month later, on April 6, 1917, the U.S. Congress declared war on Germany. After President Wilson had asserted that the world must be made safe for democracy. What was the Bataan Death March? It was one of the most brutal chapters of World War II, 1939-45. On April 9, 1942, American forces on the Bataan Peninsula, Philippines, surrendered to the Japanese. More than 75,000 American and Filipino troops became prisoners of war, POWs. On April 10, they were forced to begin a 65-mile march to a POW camp. Conditions were torturous high temperatures, meager provisions, and gross maltreatment. The troops were denied food and water for days at a time, they were not allowed to rest in the shade. They were indiscriminately beaten, and those who fell behind were killed. On stretches where some troops were transported by train. The boxcars were packed so tightly that many POWs died of suffocation. The forced march lasted more than a week. 20,000 men died along the way. But the end of the march was not the end of the horrors for the surviving POWs. About 56,000 men were held until the end of the war. They endured starvation, torture, and horrific cruelties. Some were forced to work as slave laborers in Japanese industrial plants and some became subjects of medical experiments. In August 1945 their POW camp was liberated by the Allied forces, and the surviving troops were put on U.S. Navy vessels for the trip home. As part of the United States 1951 peace treaty with Japan. Surviving POWs were barred from seeking reparations from Japanese firms that had benefited from their slave labor. This injustice continued to be the subject of proposed congressional legislation into the early 2000s. With no positive outcome for the veterans as of 2005. What happened at Pearl Harbor? 
On the night before the attack, the Japanese moved a fleet of 33 ships to within 200 miles of the Hawaiian island of Oahu, where Pearl Harbor is situated. More than 300 planes took off from the Japanese carriers. Dropping the first bombs on Pearl Harbor just before 8 a.m. on December 7. 1941 There were eight American battleships and more than 90 naval vessels in the harbor at the time. 21 of these were destroyed or damaged, as were 300 planes. The biggest single loss of the day was the sinking of the battleship USS Arizona, which went down in less than nine minutes. More than half the fatalities at Pearl Harbor that infamous. December day were due to the sinking of the Arizona. By the end of the raid, more than 2,300 people had been killed and about the same number were wounded. Pearl Harbor forever changed the United States and its role in the world. When President Franklin D. Roosevelt 1882-1945, addressed Congress the next day, he called December 7 a date which will live in infamy. The United States declared war against Japan. And on December 11 Germany and Italy Japan's Axis allies declared war on the United States. The events of December 7 had brought America into the war. A conflict from which it would emerge as the leader of the free world. When did the first U.S.